Today on this episode of The Crossover, we will be discussing the benefits of intermittent fasting with Professor of Neuroscience at the Johns Hopkins University, Dr. Mark Matson. Learn how this dietary strategy can accelerate weight loss, optimize health, and enhance performance. Much more on this episode of The Crossover. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to be talking with Dr. Mark Matson from Johns Hopkins about intermittent fasting. Hey, Mark, how you doing? All right. It's good to see you. Absolutely, man. Good to see you as well. And uh, and thanks for thanks for taking the time out to speak with us. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. I'm going to do a brief introduction just while everyone's logging on. Uh, we get the honor today of, to speak to Dr. Mark Matson, who's a world expert on intermittent fasting. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that's that's a, a dietary technique, and we'll go over all the details about the benefits of it. Everyone talks about weight loss, but really all of the overall health benefits. Uh, Dr. Matson is professor of neuroscience at Johns Hopkins and former chief of the Laboratory of Neurosciences at the National Institute on Aging. The NIH uh, considers him one of the world's top experts on intermittent fasting, which is why we'll be talking to him today. He's also author of the book, The Intermittent Fasting Revolution, and he was elected a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He's also the recipient of the Alzheimer's Association Zenith Award, the Metropolitan Life Foundation Medical Research Award, and the Santiago Chair Prize. Notably, he was the founding editor and editor-in-chief of Neuromolecular Medicine and Aging Research Review. So really a pleasure to speak to you today, Mark. Looking forward to our discussion. Likewise. Awesome. So I guess let's get into it for people who don't necessarily know exactly what is intermittent fasting. What exactly is it and how is it different from starvation? Okay, first, uh, it's an eating pattern. It's not a diet. And uh, as, as you know, the typical American eating pattern actually throughout a lot of the world is breakfast, lunch and dinner spaced out throughout the day. In fact, most Americans put something caloric in their mouth from soon after they, they get up in the morning to right before they go to bed. So intermittent fasting is an eating pattern where you go extended time periods without any calorie intake uh, of at least 12, 14 hours or more. And this can be done by ta daily time-restricted eating, where each day you compress the time window you eat into, say, a six to eight-hour time window, so that you'll be fasting up to 18 hours a day. And the reason this particular fasting period is important is it takes 12 to 14 hours for your body to switch from using glucose stores in your liver to fats and the ketones derived from those fats. So an elevation in ketone levels is a hallmark of the fasted state. Uh, it differs from starvation, and obviously these are sh what I'm talking about is very short periods of fasting. You know, it could be a couple days a week completely fasting those days, or every day fasting for most of the day. Um, and obviously, as long as you're getting sufficient calorie intake, you're not starving, and it's actually pretty easy for people who are already healthy have a healthy BMI to maintain the, their uh, current body weight. Uh, one thing that the intermittent fasting does is that it helps burn fat, particularly the white fat in your belly, uh, which is bad fat. It's kind of inflammatory type fat. And so what's happening when they get this switch to ketones and fats is you're using fats. Um, so, um, yeah, and it's conducive to maintenance of muscle mass. And I guess we can we can talk about a lot of the health benefits. So so let me get this straight. So when they talk about metabolic switching, that's what you're referring to. Yep. You basically go from using glucose to using ketones and fats. And that occurs starting at 12 to 14 hours, correct? Correct. And that's that's if you're in a and if you're in a, kind of just normal daily activities. If you exercise, say you You've been fasting for actually 10 hours, and you go on a, a one-hour run, you're going to get this metabolic switch occurring during the run. 
because obviously the exercise, you're burning up the glucose first, then you switch uh, to ketone. So the point there is if, if a person exercises when they're already getting towards that tipping point, and, and also if you exercise when you're already in the, the metabolic switch has already occurred, it causes a further boost in ketone levels. And in a lot of animal studies and some human uh, studies, exercise during fasting kind of gives a boost to the beneficial effects of both exercise and fasting. And let's be very clear, right? People are like, oh, well, I'm not going to have breakfast, but I'm going to have cream in my coffee or I'm going to have a Coke. You can have zero calories from the right. time dinner ends until lunch the next day, essentially, right? Basically 8 to yeah. eight to 12, 8 p.m. to 12 p.m. Um, what can you have? Can you have tea, black coffee, water? All of the above. Above, uh, as long as it doesn't have calories, tea and coffee don't have any calories. Now it is also um, you can stay in the ketogenic state also if you take in, in what are called medium chain triglycerides, which are kind of uh, essentially the thing that will get you out of the ketogenic state is taking in carbs. It's kind of the bottom line. So if you you stick. So let's say your lunch, let's say you get to lunch and you're having a salad with tuna. Are you still in the ketogenic state? Uh, you probably should be, yeah. Yeah, because you're not having carbs. Yeah. So. All right, let's get into the benefits which, which have been shown through scientific literature about how intermittent fasting, everyone talks about weight loss and that's great, but Let's get into the other systemic benefits. And uh, can it improve longevity? In animal studies, yes. Uh, human studies, it's obviously it take decades and decades to determine that and, and you know, like, you know, huge studies. So all I can say is then rats and mice and monkeys, um, intermittent fasting can extend lifespan. Why do they think that is? What's the hypothesis? It, yeah, so it, there are many changes that occur in cells and all our organ systems in response to intermittent fasting. One is uh, bolstering cellular stress resistance. So, for example, upregulating genes that encode antioxidant enzymes, intrinsic proteins that remove free radicals, um, stimulating a process called autophagy, which removes damaged molecules and so on, enhancing DNA re repair. Um, and actually that's probably one important factor in very clear data in animals anyway, that intermittent fasting can suppress tumor growth and, and spontaneous occurrence of tumors during aging because Cancer is usually caused by some free radical damage to DNA and a mutation that in some gene that's important for preventing cancer. Um, and then also mitochondrial health in cells. Uh, we have evidence that intermittent fasting will stimulate a process called mitochondrial biogenesis, which production of increase in number of mitochondria, the energy factory in the cells. And interestingly, a lot of the changes we see with intermittent fasting and also exercise in the brain, you see with exercise in the muscles. So, and we think this is what's happening. So during the mild energetic stress, whether it's like light aerobic exercise or even heavy uh, fasting, the cells kind of go into a, Initially, they go into a stress resistance, conserve resources mode. And then when you recover, so eating after a fasting period, exercising, or sorry, resting after exercise, and then sleep is important. It's during that recovery period, eating, sleep, that cells go into a, a growth and what we call plasticity mode. So your muscles don't get bigger while you're exercising, they actually grow 
during the rest period, mm -hmm. we've actually shown in the brain of animals that uh, more, more synaptic connections will be formed during neurons uh, during, in response to intermittent fasting. Over a period of time, these changes are not occurring like in one day. It takes several weeks to a month to start to see these changes, just like when you exercise. Your muscles don't, aren't bigger the next day. You don't notice it, right? It takes time. So, Now, what about um, insulin resistance? There, has there been data to show that yeah. intermittent fasting reduces insulin resistance? A lot of data. And that's, that's one of the, there's more data than that, on that than a lot of things, almost as much as uh, weight loss for people who are overweight. And um, so this makes a lot of sense. So if your cells aren't getting glucose for an extended time period, what they do is they, uh, they respond in a way that helps them more readily take up glucose and remove it from the blood when the individual does consume carbohydrates, right? So there's a, that's what insulin sensitive, they become more sensitive to insulin so that they're better able to remove glucose. And that's, again, it's very similar to exercise. It improves glucose regulation increases insulin sensitivities. So kind of a one take home message is, we've seen in animal studies, now there's a huge literature on intermittent fasting. A few years ago, a colleague of mine at the NIA and I were invited to write a review article for the New England Journal of Medicine, which is a journal that most MDs like you probably at least browse through. Uh, and there are two reasons they asked us to write the review. One, a lot of physicians didn't know anything about intermittent fasting and that there was a lot of science behind it, and yet these physicians are, are being approached by patients asking the physician about it. <coughs> and the, the second reason was there's actually a lot of data from human studies now, clinical trials, mostly with obesity and overweight, but also type 2 diabetes. Um, there's a lot of emerging studies coming out with cancers where, you know, again, the preclinical evidence suggested that if you are to hit the cancer cells with chemotherapeutic drugs or radiation while the individual is in a fasted state, it's easier to kill those cancer cells. And the reason is a lot of cancer cells, not all, but many, rely almost exclusively on glucose as their energy source. So, you know, if they're put under the severe stress of radiation and these toxic drugs, when they aren't getting enough energy, they're killed more easily. So if you go on to clinicaltrials.gov now and you put in intermittent fasting in quotes and cancer, you'll see, I haven't checked in the last month, but it's increasing rapidly. A lot of clinical trials in various cancers with this kind of approach. Um, yeah, so anyway, and there's been an exponential increase in human studies, which is good. In fact, the NIH last year, no, the year before, put out what's called a re RFA, Request for Applications for Grants, specifically for human clinical trials of intermittent fasting in various conditions. One, I know I'm talking a lot, but one thing I haven't mentioned is effects on cardiovascular systems. Yeah, I was just going to ask because that's okay. a big one yeah. that people i don't think really appreciate that intermittent fasting has a lot of heart benefits if you could just go into that yeah well, one is improving lipid profiles you know uh, uh, increased hdl levels the good uh, good protein that binds to cholesterol high density lipoprotein and um, reducing triglycerides also increasing insulin sensitivity is, is protective against heart disease. And then one thing we found that in animal studies initially, and then it's been confirmed in human studies, is it's very interesting. It's um, reducing resting heart rate and blood pressure and increasing what's called heart rate variability, which is kind of an indicator of the ability of the heart to adapt to, to an imposed strain stress, you know, exercise, or maybe even mental stress. So uh, 
again, these changes are similar to what's seen with exercise. Now, quantitatively, exercise, you know, has a bigger, quantitatively bigger effect in reducing resting heart rate and lowering blood pressure. But, you know, the direction of intermittent fasting is the same as exercise. So what are the different types of intermittent fasting? We've gone over all the benefits, neurologic, cardiovascular, metabolic, weight loss, insulin resistance. So clearly it has benefits, but what are the different options for people who may want to start doing intermittent fasting? Yeah, the, the, Rick, the one we talked about at, at the first was um, daily time restricted eating, where you compress the time window to say six to eight hours of eating. And for most people's daily lifestyle and so on, the easiest thing to do is skip breakfast because you just get up go to work, uh, you know, and then you can still have lunch with friends and stuff and dinner with the family, and you can still compress that time window. Another one that actually led to the popularization of and kind of the explosion of chatter on the Internet in around 2013 or 14 is called 5-2 intermittent fasting. Two days a week, you eat only about 500 calories. So just one moderate-sized meal. And uh, that... That's 500 calories in a day is not enough to keep you from going into the, you know, having this metabolic switch occur. Um, and those are the two most commonly used approaches. Uh, uh, so in clinical trials, there have been more rigorous, severe, kind of what I'd say very severe that I wouldn't recommend to people that are already healthy. Maybe someone who's overweight is every other day eat only about 500 calories. Um, psychologically, we think that daily time-restricted eating is the easiest uh, because it's just something you incorporate into your daily routine. You don't have to think about it much. Um, and another thing, compared to calorie counting at every meal, again, psychologically, you know, people who are overweight, you know, they're they're worried about it, right? They want to improve their health, and so every meal they are kind of counting calories and so on, and they become kind of obsessed with this and have to think about it all the time. Uh, yeah, so anyway, there's another approach that uh, Walter Longo at USC kind of has used in his animal and some human studies. It's, uh, what's it? it's like five consecutive days a month, you eat only about 600 calories. and, and and he's found health, you know, over months and months and months, health benefits of that. Now, one, one very important practical consideration for someone who's not doing intermittent fasting eating pattern now and wants to switch is that you will be hungry initially during the time period you've previously been eating. You know, say with daily time restricted eating, if you start skipping breakfast, you're going to be hungry in the morning. But if you stick with it for at least two weeks, you will no longer be hungry. By a month, we find, and I've been involved in human studies on this, and, you know, getting feedback from the people in the studies that, again, between two, two weeks and a month, they adapt so that they're no longer hungry and irritable during the time period they've previously been eating. And this is, this is the best way to overcome that hunger, right? Because people who are listening may want to get started on this intermittent fasting. They're excited to get all the health benefits. But obviously the first two weeks, you're going to be hungry. So just drink a lot of water, you know, stay hydrated. I've heard all different kinds of tips. Well, you need, this is important. You should always keep hydrated with water during the fasting period. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think water helps any with the hunger. Tea and coffee likely do because you're putting something that has taste and uh you know kind of a pleasurable experience um i mentioned exercise um i don't know for me anyway when i exercise i actually don't feel hungry after i exercise so believe it or not exercising during the fasting period I was just going to ask, so, you know, so clearly you're recommending exercise during the fasting period. People may want to say, okay, I'm going to fast 
I am, I'm having less calories in during a day. How do I incorporate exercise? And so you're saying it can be during the fast, it can be during the eating part, but there's really no right or wrong to when you should exercise. Actually, we don't know yet. There's a lot of interest in this from endurance athletes. Um, it used to be, for for example, ultra marathon competitors or triathlon, uh, and, and some still do. They take on essentially they take on carbohydrates periodically during the event, you know, over hours. Um, and so I noticed this. I used to do a lot of trail running, and you know I would eat breakfast and then some days I'd forget to take my lunch to the lab and I'd, I'd go on trail runs like late afternoon and so I just serendipitously found that if I didn't eat breakfast lunch and then did the trail run in the late afternoon I actually ran better than if I ate lunch and if you think about, about this from an evolutionary perspective it makes sense um, particularly from predator standpoint right where a lot of predators, wolves, whatever, they'll go a week without killing a prey, or at least, you know, several days at a time. And their brains and bodies have to function very well in that food-deprived state. And so through millions of years of evolution, you know, our cellular systems, our organ systems, how they function, they've evolved to function really well in a food-deprived state because if, if an individual didn't function well in that state, they wouldn't be successful in getting food and passing their genes on. So I think if you just look at it that in a simple evolutionary perspective, this all makes a lot of sense. Can you, so people who may work out regularly, frequently, and at a, at a high intensity, does intermittent fasting allow you to retain muscle mass or does the reduced calorie cause breakdown of muscle? No, as long as your overall calorie intake over days is maintained, you can still build muscle. There have been multiple, probably at least a half a dozen or more now, studies of uh, in, in uh, resistance training. You know, divide the people into two groups. One of them does intermittent fasting, the other doesn't, and then they go several months resistance training, measure whatever muscle size of biceps, you know, whatever muscles they're measuring. And essentially they found, most of them find no significant difference between intermittent fasting or not in terms of building muscle. Uh, so, so, yeah, kind of, and you know, bodybuilders, and this is interesting, they discovered, I guess, serendipitously that if they don't eat breakfast and do their weight training like late morning, and then, of course, they take a lot of protein, which I think is not good in the long run. But anyway, so they, they eat after that. So they found that that works really well because they can still build muscle mass, number one, but they're working out in a ketogenic state. So they're actually boosting their loss of fat, which for them, you know, they want not only big muscles, but lean. They want, well, you want to be able to see the muscle. Yeah. So they reduce the fat. So. Yeah, so I think just that simple fact that most of these, that's my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, or maybe you don't know, but I'm, I'm pretty sure because I've actually looked into this, that's the way they do it. And, and again, as far as protein, so I mentioned that when in the fasted state, your, your cells upregulate their ability to take up glucose. They also upregulate in the fasted state, when you're not taking any proteins in, amino acid levels in your blood, the building blocks of proteins, kind of stay low. So again, in response to the fasting, the cells actually boost their ability to take up the amino acids when you do eat the protein. Interesting. And I think another question is, can are there any groups of people who cannot do intermittent fasting, or is it for everyone? Uh Elderly, frail people. Yeah, actually, there haven't been any studies, but I did this intuitively, maybe not. Although, again, you know, if, they get, if you're losing muscle mass, if you don't exercise, you're not going to be able to maintain your muscle mass. So, you know, that's 
kind of the bottom line there. Then, um, obviously, little children who are in a you know, rapidly growing state. And then people with type 1 diabetes, you know, which is uh, they, they don't, their pancreas isn't producing insulin. They require insulin because intermittent fasting increases insulin sensitivity well like they just have to be more careful with their insulin actually i'd predict they could probably end up lowering the amount of insulin they take uh, you know if they, they can figure out with their doctor how to adjust that now what about people may say okay i'm going to fast for those 16 hours and that gives me carte blanche to eat whatever i want during the other eight is there any what's the best types of meals or during those eight hours is there a regimen that you recommend yeah and i put, put this you know everything we've talked about i cover in the so i i wrote a book that's a science of intermittent fasting so there's a lot of science with references in there and but so i'm kind of a proponent of you know a lot of vegetables nuts you know, I think beans, some whole grains are fine as long as they're whole grains. Uh, completely avoid simple sugars. You know, no glucose, no fructose, no sucrose. Um, and good fats, you know, fish instead of red meat. And um, yeah, so, you know, if you look, you've probably heard of this blue zones, these certain regions of the world where there's exceptional longevity. People seem to live a long period of time. And, and there's some commonalities between those uh, regions, whether it's in islands by Japan or Seventh-day Adventists in California. Uh, one is actually, they have a pretty high-carb diet, but it's all from vegetables and complex carbs, beans, um, root things like, you know, uh, whatever, sweet potatoes. And um, they have actually low red meat intake. Some of them are on coast, so they have high fish intake. Um, I'm not a proponent of the ketogenic diet, per se, particularly if they have high in saturated fats. And, um, yeah, I think it's better to... You know, if you look at our teeth, Rick, um, you know, just look at our teeth. Yeah, we have like these really small canines, but essentially our, our teeth are made for grinding. You know, chew off something and grind it or chew nuts or that kind of thing. So, you know, there's all these debates as did we evolve as carnivores or we, we clearly evolved as omnivores. And... In a lot of the hunter-gatherer societies, most of their calories are actually through carbs, and certainly our our non-human primate ancestors, you know, it's mostly carbs. So I I think this you know paleo thing is a little misleading in terms of the picture of a caveman, you know, going out, out killing animals and all they're eating is meat. Uh, it's, so the data that you're that you're kind of putting together looks incredibly favorable for intermittent fasting. Weight loss, energy levels, as we said, memory, heart, insulin resistance, all that. Are there any negative side effects to intermittent fasting? Uh, um, so far, really none have appeared actually in the literature. Again, um, I would think that if an individual is losing a lot of fat and not exercising, then uh, it might be contraindicated. Otherwise, nothing has really popped up in the literature. Oh, one potential one, again, but there's no data on this again, anorexia nervosa, which is uh, a, it's a psychiatric disorder, mostly in adolescent girls, you know, kind of obsessing about their about body image it's not limited to girls but and um essentially they obsess over calories and exercise excessively so that's kind of going overboard i there's a term called hormesis which is essentially what doesn't kill you makes you stronger well there's this kind of hormetic zone where you know 
moderate levels of physiological challenges, exercise, fasting, intellectual challenges, in the case of your brain cells. There's a certain range that these things are good, but you can go overboard. You can go overboard on exercise. I think there's data coming out now that ultra marathoners who've done this their whole life, when they get in their 60s and 70s, they start having some issues maybe as a, as a consequence of that. So, uh, yeah, we, we have to... We have to continue, we have to challenge ourselves every day intellectually, physically, maybe metabolically, uh, and but we have to be able to recover too. Yeah. And in case of anorexia, they never allow recovery. So, you know, that leads me to my final question because I know you're very busy, but give us your crystal ball view. What breakthroughs do you see in the next 10, 20 years in terms of our understanding of human physiology, dietary patterns, and our overall metabolism? I think it's going to continue in the, the same direction. <laughs> the things we already know are good for our health. Exercise, uh, moderation in calorie intake, intermittent fasting, keeping intellectually and socially engaged. Um, there's a lot of efforts in the research end of it to develop dietary supplements. And this is actually, as you know, big industries. Um, unfortunately, many of which, uh, in my view, are selling snake oil uh, in terms of the scientific literature. So this, the complexity of the physiological the cellular molecular systems, the signaling pathways, the gene expression patterns, the coordination of the systems that are engaged by exercise and fasting, and even keeping in mind it will actually engage. They're very complex. They evolved over millions of years of evolution, and they don't involve just one pathway. So there's no way you're going to be able to – there's not going to be a fountain of youth in terms of some – Chemical. So I don't think people should count on the research anytime soon, um, you know, providing something they can have a couch potato lifestyle and still live to be 100. Yeah. So uh, from that standpoint, I don't think there's going to be a breakthrough. I would say, you know, just, just wrapping up because it's been, it's been terrific talking to you. I think that intermittent fasting, at least as far as I'm concerned, is the most sustainable form of eating pattern compared to all the other, like you said, paleo and ketogenic and all that. It seems like intermittent fasting is the most sustainable. It works with someone who has a professional lifestyle. It requires some discipline in the morning. You got to get through a little bit of that hunger, but all the benefits that you showed and have shown and are still showing with your literature are just so remarkable. The fact that less calories, and that fasting period and that metabolic switching that you discussed earlier improves your brain, improves your heart, improves longevity. I think it's just fascinating that that little simple change in your dietary habits can have such a profound effect on your overall health. And I think it's, a, it's, it's great for our listeners to learn more about it. And again, I, I really make a strong analogy with regular exercise because it turns out when you get down to what's happening in the cells and organ systems, there's a lot of commonalities. Um, yeah, so, you know, I've enjoyed talking with you. Um, I hope, you know, one, one big problem, that, and I have a chapter in this on my book on the dark forces, that, you know, there, there's, as you know, our healthcare system is geared up to letting people get sick and then, you know, managing their symptoms. And there needs to be more effort at the, at the government level and, and and education level of prevention rather than, you know, in, in conjunction with treatment. Absolutely. I think, I think dietary, uh, you know, what you eat, how much you exercise and how much you sleep. If you can do those three things, yeah. diet, exercise and sleep, I think yeah. that's like 90% of health. So I agree. anyway, listen, Mark, thank you so much for all your time today. Great speaking with you and have a wonderful weekend. Enjoyed it. Likewise. Bye. Take care, Mark.